So welcome friends to the first Sunday meeting. Today is also celebrated as Teacher's Day in many parts of the world. Krishnaji is a teacher and often asked this question, can we ever live on this beautiful earth peacefully? Today, we have requested another teacher and a friend of Study Center Bangalore to give a talk on this topic. Dr. Shailesh Shirali is a passionate mathematics teacher and also a director of Community Math Center and is also a recipient of National Award for Teachers in 2013. I thought it is our great uh, joy to be together on this Teacher's Day to listen to Dr. Shailesh Shirali. Sir, we are very keenly waiting to listen to you. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Murli. Thank you very much to the Study Center Valley School for inviting me. I think the topic that you have given me is um, it's a very important one to talk about and also a, a tough nut to crack <laughs> historically. And I think it is appropriate that we can talk about it and discuss it on this Teacher's Day. So happy Teacher's Day to all. And let's see if we can ask this question whether we as teachers can do anything about this tremendous problem of violence and aggression on, on earth among us, which has been around for so very long. So let me just tell you the format that I have in mind. I'm going to follow the format of a presentation for about 40 minutes or so. I'll screen something and speak along with it. So the you will find many quotes uh, displayed on the screen. So that's why it helps to have it in printed form. And then I will close the presentation after about 40, 45 minutes. And then we can discuss this question, the, the questions which arise from this. Uh, so I hope that is all right with you. In fact, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to uh, uh, ask, pose some questions for all of us. Okay, so I'll just share the screen right now. Just a minute, please. Yeah, here it is. So yeah, I hope it's visible to all. So living peaceful, peacefully on earth, I think uh, if you look at the historical records, it appears that there have been wars and there has been conflict between human beings for very, very long. So this is a question which is often asked by people, is peace merely the interval between two wars? And it, if you look again at history, it seems as if the answer is yes. You see this cycle, you have war, then there are people exhausted from that war, then there is a time of rebuilding and talk of peace and so on, and then slowly unrest develops, and then once again people prepare for war, that you have arms trades, arms sales going on, and the drums of war again start to sound. So this is an old, old cycle. And it's not as if these problems can be traced to any particular person. I think we, the public often has this habit of blaming everything on the politicians. They are the cause of the problem and so on, so on. But obviously the problem is much, much deeper than that. And anyone who has read Krishnamurti uh, will know the way he has uh, looked at the problem, how he has traced it down to what happens in our daily lives. So some of that I'm going to go over here in this presentation. And as I've said, written out here, we are all part of the problem. Of course, there are contributions coming from every possible side the scientists, the business leaders, the politicians, and all of us, you know, ordinary people. Look at what's happening in the world, you know, engulfed by crisis in every direction. You have the problem of fundamentalism, which is growing stronger in so many parts of the world. And unfortunately, even in India, then we have the problem of nationalism, 
of a very resurgent and very violent nationalism which is coming up in not only our country, but it is very much stronger in many other parts of the country, uh, so many parts of the world, sorry, China, uh, parts of Europe, Russia, and so on. And then identity has been an off and on issue uh, through history. That is the assertion of identity, that we are something. It may be as identity with regard to religion, which is again connected with fundamentalism, asserting in a very aggressive and militaristic way what you are, but it could also be identity with a nation. So there are many forms in which identity takes, and it could also be with of a different kind altogether. It need not be associated with a religion or with a nation, but identity is invariably a conflicting phenomenon. Then you have this strange problem which is becoming bigger by the day in today's world of an echo chamber where we get locked into particular communities, maybe through social networks, where we keep hearing the same opinion again and again because by the nature of these communities, they uh, you get you end up meeting only people who think in exactly the same way as you do. And gradual communication breakdown between people who, of that group in which you are, your particular echo chamber and somebody else's. In fact, the problem has become so acute that no conversation even can happen. Conversation invariably becomes violent and there's a complete breakdown of communication. So you communicate only with people whom you feel you, they believe the same things that you do. And then this new strange phenomenon called fake news. Of course, propaganda has been around for a long time, but in today's world with the advent of artificial intelligence, fake news has become a very deadly phenomenon. And I've also listed this, this line out here, which doesn't look like something connected with war and aggression, and yet it is in a way. Consumerism has become a disease of our times. It has been around for maybe, uh, maybe 70, 80 years since the 1940s or 50s, or maybe still earlier. But our pattern of consumption, our, you know, our dependence on entertainment of various kinds has itself generated its own kind of, of uh, you know, side effects, which contribute to aggression. We can perhaps talk about it later. And of course, it is a, it is a direct aggression on nature. You know, the waste that we are generating and the environmental collapse, which is now happening so visibly all around us. So it's another kind of uh, aggression, which ultimately will result in human conflict because of shortage of resources and so on. And then this terrible problem of the rich and the poor, the violence that is, that is implicit in the very way that our society is structured with enormous gulf between rich and poor, and it is growing in many parts of the world, certainly in India, we are, we are seeing a growing divide between rich and poor, and the digital divide also is contributing to that. So we might, we might ask really, what is the cause of all this? And is there any hope of addressing such deep and such extensive problems? Because our, our approach all through for the past centuries perhaps has always been patchwork reform. Anytime there's a problem, we put a kind of a bandaid on it, try to, try to settle the problem just locally. Everything is patchwork. And you know, there you try to solve the problem of fake news by introducing some laws. You try to solve the problem of waste by finding some way of uh, recycling. We don't attack a problem at its fundamental level. So what when we ask what is the cause of, especially the things at the top, fundamentalism, nationalism, and identity, we have to really go deep down. So I've asked a few questions out here. Is it the love of power, the love of control, the desire to control others? But, you know, there's a certain violence in, in power and, a, and obviously a love of control also, which this is not a recent phenomenon. The love of power and love of control go back 
perhaps thousands of years or at least several centuries. And there's a very famous statement here, which shows that in a way this, you know, it is, uh, people recognize that it, power is a problem, that power inevitably corrupts, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there's a still more delightful statement, which goes back to Abraham Lincoln, where he says that nearly all men can stand adversity, you know, difficulty, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. I think it's a very perceptive statement. How to handle power is a deep problem which goes back in history. Now, power can be power in an organization. You, are, you have access to a lot of finances, maybe. You have the possible, you know, somebody's job is in your hands, or it may be something much with much vaster scope. But the, there is a certain late, you know, hidden aggression or not so hidden aggression inside that the when you have a relationship based on power so this is one very important point which we have to consider because if it is there in us a love of power what can education do about it ultimately that's the question which need, we need to ask what can we as teachers do about a love of power if it is there in us as human beings is it the love of violence and excitement which again has a connection with power and control, the love of competition, the love of the feeling of defeating somebody, the aggression that is contained in that. You see it very much in today's sports. Is it the love of excitement, the adrenaline rush which you feel, and that's connected with, with boredom, which is perhaps part of today's um, social structure that there's a tremendous degree of boredom in us today. And we are addicted to excitement. And you can see it in the kinds of uh, uh, experiences that we crave, for, the speed that we want, the, the journeys that we undertake. So addiction to excitement, addiction to adrenaline rush, I think have become very endemic to us. And just, and this is not something very recent, This Perhaps this habit has been with us for a long time, but of course, today's technology is making it all the more possible. And I want to give you an example of this. The, just the other day, I was watching a video, uh, the, a, a videotape showing the declaration of war by Mussolini during the Second World War when he declared war on Britain and France. Germany at that time was already at war. And uh, Italy was just about to step into the war. And Mussolini came out, comes out onto his corridor. And there is this in, immense crowd gathered in front of that building. Must be, I don't know, 100,000 or more people gathered, all chanting his name. You know, he, he was called the Duce. The Duce, Duce, they're all chanting. And then he announces in a grand way that it is our honor to fight and we have sent a declaration of war to the ambassadors of France um, and uh, Britain. And you should see the kind of cheering which breaks out in the people. They're so excited, so thrilled at this declaration of war. It just shows that, you know, people seem to actually crave that, that experience, that wanting to get into conflict, the whole excitement of, of weapons and shooting and shooting, gunning down an enemy. So it, this is something which, you know, so I, my previous slide I had written, how do we tackle the love of power that it seems to be there, not only in adults, but even in children, you can see it. And then the same question out here, is it the love of violence and our addiction to excitement and adrenaline? And this example is there. And just to give you another such example, it's a quote from uh, this conversation, which, uh, you know, there's this video series called The Transformation of Man, a uh, conversation between uh, Krishnamurti and David Scheinberg, the, the psychologist, and David Bohm. And Scheinberg at one point quotes this example about somebody who went to Vietnam to fight. And he was asked by a reporter, why did he volunteer to go? 
And his answer was, if he didn't go, his life was every night at the bar. Just think of the, the sorrow in this tragedy in this statement. Here is a person who is living a life in which every night, all he does is go to the bar and probably utterly lonely, bored, you know, unhappy, and suddenly the possibility of going and fighting and doing something which sounds important, fighting for your country, you know, going through dangerous experiences with their own the excitement that they bring. So this, is, this statement, I think, is very revealing. The, it reveals the kind, of, uh, the kind of boredom which people are living through. And an even older statement, which you'll be quite startled with, is this one. Of, made by Henry David Thoreau, in which he says, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. It's a very scary statement really, to hear that people live lives of quiet desperation. And what is this quiet desperation that they are living through? You know, every day going and participating in some work, going to office, whatever, commuting, doing some work which perhaps means nothing to them, just they have to do it because they need to earn some money and then come back to a life of possible conflict. You know, people are caught, it's like a treadmill. You just go round and round in this infinite circle. And I think what Thoreau has pinpointed here is, is dead accurate and very uh, scary also, that the mass of men living lives. So here's this another cause which we have pinpoint pointed to here, the love of violence and excitement. Then is it the demand for identity? Not that these are unconnected, all these sort of are linked together, but they are just looking at it separately. The demand for identity, which is growing today, identity which is connected with fundamentalism. And it's a very interesting question to ask where fundamentalism has originated. What has given it its, its vitality, its strength uh, in the modern, this past say 100 years or so? And similarly for nationalism, where has that demand come from? Or if not identity with an organization, it's also identity with my own, my own self, with my own experiences. The desire for one-upmanship, the desire to always preserve one's self-image, you know, very compulsively to defend one's self-image, the whole fear of losing face, and there is a particularly horrible phenomenon which we are hearing a lot about honor killings, uh, where you kill somebody in the name of defending the honor of your family. So identity and all these things are linked together and they ge generate a great deal of, of uh, violence. Then similarly connected with this is the worship of success, the worship of accomplishment and this strange thing called personal fulfillment. There's, there's a, you know, especially in our country, we have a tremendous worship of success and worship of accomplishment. We, and it generates its own forces, its own, uh, you know, what happens in its wake. Um, So this is another point which I have put down here, the demand for identity. Then I think there's a last slide of that kind that I have here. Is it our collective obsessions? Obsessions with, th obsession with things that really are unimportant or downright false. You'll, if you look through our lives in society, there are so many things about which we obsess, which we are completely, they take up all our time. It could be social media, could be obsession with gossip, could be obsession with the lives of rich and famous people. We are so keen to know what is happening, especially with the you know billionaires and so on. That, that's one kind of obsession or it could be the obsession with finance and the stock market, with real estate, 
with this purchasing gold and jewelry and obsession with fashion, you know, the fashion industry. Fashion industry is a good example of, a, of obsession. And it's not, a, it's not a benign obsession. It's not a harmless obsession. It generates enormous amount of waste. It's a, one of the environmentally worst obsessions you can imagine. Then obsession with individuality. We have this notion which has become stronger over the decades that we are individuals. And this that I must have a particular point of view, I must defend that point of view. Obsession with ideologies, obsessions with theories. So all these are, are there, you know, these are all part of you may wonder how why have I listed this all these out here? I think, for example, let's take something like individuality. It's essentially a separative force, a separative phenomenon. And our, our idea that we are uh, individuals like little atoms unconnected with, with everybody else, we just operate on our own, that if I have some talent, I am the sole possessor of that talent. If I have accomplished something, I am the author, the owner of that accomplishment. I think all these separative notions which have become very strong and are actually being strengthened by society today. They're all things which, which contribute in their own way to, to violence. Because in an, it, the connection is not immediate, but the connection is through the separation, the, the loss of relationship that they create. We all, we are, you know, falling more and more in, in love with ourselves, so to speak, with our own individuality, with our talent, with our own, how much, how rich we are or whatever. So I want to now mention very briefly something which one recent writer has been talking about and how it connects very closely with what something that Krishnaji is talking about. Very briefly, just there are three slides out here. There's this author called Yuval Hirari, Harari, and he has introduced the notion of a fictional reality. And he says that one of the things about human beings, our unique trait, he says, is the ability to create and believe fiction. And this is something quite interesting here because it connects with something uh, which you know, comes out in the conversations between Bohm and Krishnamurti. Uh, so Harari points out here, other animals use their communication system to describe real things. Okay, it, can, it may be a, a bark which indicates, uh, some sound which indicates danger or which indicates happiness. It's, it describes reality. But we use our own communication system to create fictional realities which don't even exist. For example, one very famous one is money, which, which is just a symbol and yet it has become real as a result of that. So it's like, so this, in fact, the, the word that, that Krishnaji uses is thought, but it's interesting to see how Harari looks at this. Continuing, fiction has enabled us to imagine things collectively. So using fiction, we can weave myths such as creation stories, and we can weave the nationalistic myths of modern states. So the nation itself is an excellent example of a, of a fictional reality. There is no such thing as a nation. And yet we, we create that idea and enough of us talk about it, enough of us believe in it, and then it becomes real. And then in the name of that nation, you can wage war. So it just shows the power of this uh, business of uh, this fiction. They, it so happens that such myths also have enabled us to cooperate flexibly in large numbers, and that has contributed to our uh, evolution. And the last slide on this is, ants also work together in huge numbers, but they are very rigid. They, there's no flexibility in that. Or if you take an animal like the wolf, wolves cooperate flexibly. But, they, but their cooperation is with very small numbers, just the, the other wolves in their pack and so on. Of course, it's very interesting that cooperation, animal behavior and so on, but it's with small numbers. We are the sole uh, animals, you can say, or the beings 
who can cooperate in highly flexible ways with countless others. And it all comes from this ability to create symbols and myths and fiction and live in that fiction. So you see now the consequence of that. On the one hand, it has contributed to our immense success. If you, these fictions probably go back, I would imagine probably some 40, 50,000 years. We have, been, we have been having that ability for, with us, but it has enabled us to grow. It has enabled us to literally cover the earth. We are there in every remote part of the earth. So as a species, we have become so successful. But there are other things which come along with it. So we have enabled, we have created fictions like money, like nationalities, corporations and organizations, things like the constitution of a country, notion like, notions like human rights, everything, every one of these is a fiction. And yet they have become very real in our life. And we are willing to, to die for them. Or even more, we are willing to kill for them. Similarly, for, for example, these fictions in the name of ideology, which is clearly a fiction, you're willing to kill in the name of justice, equality, freedom, these are the, the you know, slogans of the French Revolution, fraternity, equality, and so on. In the name of God, fictions like heaven and hell. And an excellent example, I think, is what is happening right, right now in Afghanistan. It's the, it shows a perfect case study of how all these things are going on. On the one hand, you have fundamentalism, which is in full display. And what is, what is the, what lies underneath that fundamentalism? It's a fiction, a fiction about a certain way of, a certain kind of a past, a certain kind of a way of looking at the world. And that fiction has to be preserved at all costs because it is given so much value. So think of the violence which can come from that. And on the other hand, if you look at the, the, the past of that same country, do you see the greed of empires of the British Empire in an earlier era, the American, you know, various European countries, calling it the great game and so on. So there is the nation, which is the fiction of the nation and the fiction of fundamentalism, everything colliding and creating this utterly horrible reality. Or you look at what is happening in that other country, in the United States, the kind of problems they are having with guns and why, why does that exist even? Because there is, a, there is again a fictional a law which they have created for themselves. They call it the second or some amendment and they have to protect freedom. So freedom, rights, all it's like a toxic mix of things which create enormous conflict. As you know, United States today is a country in tremendous, which is experiencing tremendous conflict at the, at the individual level. So you begin to see here the power of words, the power of symbols and the power of imagination. And this connects very directly with the things which, uh, which Krishnamurti is talking about, has been talking about. E every one of these has great, has great value in our lives, right? We, we need words, we need symbols, we need imagination. All these are needed for our technological progress, our technological, technological work. They allow us, they give us immense abilities. For example, we would never have gotten to the moon we would have never gotten to the remote parts of the earth without these powers. But those same powers are creating all the havoc on earth. So unless we find a way of coming to terms with this, this thing, we are, we are really you know, very in a dangerous situation. And it's very interesting that in that one conversation between Krishnamurti and David Bohm, Krishnamurti asks, Sir, when did humanity take a wrong turn? And they have a bit of a conversation about it. <clears throat> and I wonder sometimes whether that wrong turn goes into our distant past when we first learned to 
use our imag imagination and symbols and the power of words in order to for our own self interest it's obviously something which goes back very very far in time so what was earlier an ability to which they used to trap animals perhaps became an ability to perhaps first trap more animals than they needed to actually start exploiting and destroying the environment and then become a factor of self interest just another example of of the fictional reality you know in 1985 krishna ji gave a talk at the united nation this pacham in terrace that is peace on earth this is latin for peace on earth and that phrase comes from a document made in written in 1963 by pope john the 23rd in which he writes peace on earth which man throughout the ages has so longed for and sought after can never be established never guaranteed except by the diligent observance of the divinely established order so there is a belief here in this statement that there will be peace only from the divine so you see here also that that whole notion is operating that and in contrast you have this description which is this response given by krishna ji someone asks him is not belief in god necessary in this terrible and ruthless world and here is what he responds we have had belief in god for centuries yet we have created a terrible world the savage and the highly civilized priest believe in god the primitive kills with bows and arrows and the civilized priest blesses the warships and the bombers both believe and also there is the non believer who resorts to liquidating those who stand in his way clinging to a belief or to an ideology does not do away with killing it doesn't do away with oppression and exploitation on the contrary there continue to be terrible wars and destruction and persecution in the name of peace and god if we can put aside these beliefs and ideologies and bring about a deep change in our daily life there will be a chance for a better world it is our everyday life that has brought about these horrors our thoughtlessness our exclusive national and economic privileges and barriers and our lack of goodwill and compassion worldliness will constantly erupt in chaos and in sorrow it's a very powerful passage this one there's a lot which which it says particularly that last line and here's another such passage very famous phrase associated with krishna murti war is a spectacular and bloody projection of our everyday life we precipitate war out of our daily lives and without a transformation in ourselves there are bound to be national and racial antagonisms the childish quarreling over ideologies the multiplication of soldiers the saluting of flags and all the many brutalities that go to create organized murder so i have just written a sentence at the end here unless we come to terms with our greed and our tendency to live in this fictional unreal world we will not have peace on earth and one example which i had not listed in the earlier slide an example of a fic fiction is the flag a symbol we have given you know flags have become so important all over the world in some countries much more so than in india and we somehow don't see we are unable to see the the you know the danger of it so where does one begin is it a collective illusion which we are carrying a maya is it an inability to see what in life is transient is ephemeral just passes by and yet we give it importance and what are the things that truly endure 
there's a huge difference to be to have a discerning eye and to be able to see what is transient what passes away quickly and what has what is truly valuable what will endure and this statement is i think a very key one that worldliness will con constantly erupt in chaos is are we unable to see this apparently we are we are so so addicted to worldliness so again such a backdrop of conditioning and this conditioning goes back probably not just hundreds of years but thousands of years is there really any possibility of peace at all i think we as teachers particularly have to ask this question how does one how does one find a a road a, a, an entry point into this conditioning which we all have recall our assembly song which we all sing i think in all our songs mat kar tu abhiman re bande i particularly like the last last two lines in that tere paas mein heere moti mere man mandir mein jyoti kaun hua dhanwan re bande what is going to give us this wisdom i have asked out here where does one begin to nurture in children a love for wisdom a love for jyoti as it's called here a love for light unless we find a way of creating nurturing that a love for truth i think that's the only thing which can really tackle this problem of of violence every other approach is simply patchwork reform look at some quotes which i have shown from krishna ji is the is part of the problem wrong relationship yes it is conflict and confusion result from our own wrong relationship with people wrong relationship with things and with ideas and until we understand that relationship and alter it mere learning the gathering of facts and the acquiring of various skills can only lead us to engulfing chaos and destruction again it's a packed sentence there's a tremendous amount in it wrong relationship with people in which power dominates in which oppression dominates wrong relationship with things excessive attachment to property and we have to understand why we are so attached to property and then wrong relationship with ideas why do we give so much importance to ideologies when we we are not able to see that these ideologies are deadly that they separate so until we are able to understand our why we are so attached to in a wrong way to all these things because all of them may have their place things property all they have their place in life ideas may have their place in life but why do we have this strange relationship with it so mere learning and gathering facts which is what schooling is mostly about acquiring various skills it's only going to lead to engulfing chaos so again i have asked you where can such understanding begin and clearly the answer is school and elsewhere krishna ji writes a school is a place where one learns the right place of knowledge which means really the the accurate accurate the real domain where knowledge matters and where it does not matter then it's a place where one learns the importance of relationship not which is not based on attachment and finally the art of listening it's a place where one learns the art of listening looking and learning so let's see how this relates to that what was written in the earlier piece if one has the you know if one understands for oneself the right place of knowledge one will then naturally have the right relationship with knowledge one will not be overly attached to 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 things which are perhaps wrong wrong knowledge which are which is actually in harari's language it is fictional reality it's also a kind of knowledge which we have created but we have become tremendously attached to those fictions then having proper understanding of relationship being related in in a way which is not based on attachment 
So relationship with human beings and relationship with property. And then the art of listening, looking and learning, which is I think of extreme importance out here. There's a tremendous amount to be talked about here. What are all these things based on? Look at this, you know, there's one video, you may have heard it, where one questioner asks him, what is the significance of history, the teaching of history in the education of the young? And he answers very briefly, these are just excerpts. If history is the, is the story of mankind, the story of human beings, then both the educator and the young are also the human being. It's not just some other human beings, they are also the human beings and it is their story, not merely the story of kings and wars. So the question then comes, how can the educator help the student to understand the story of himself, which is the story of the past? So what is the significance of this? It is perhaps, well, I'll go on here. If you are the educator and I am the young student, how would you help me understand the whole nature of myself? Myself being the whole of humanity, my brain being the result of a million years. It is all in me, the violence, the competition, the aggressiveness, brutality, fear, pleasure, and the occasional joy and perfume of love. How will you help me to understand all this? I have this piece here on my machine. We can actually read through it later because I think it's a very important piece. So if one really understands oneself, for example, in the sense, in the manner that is being suggested, perhaps there will be less of an attachment to my, I, this whole business of identity, to my accomplishment, to my memories, psychological memories, which are obviously the basis of a great deal of violence in individual, my own relationship with people around me. And then if you add it up over society. So there, here's another res response, which I think I'm going to lead, take one particular phrase from this uh, for uh, exploration. A child asks him, I think this happened in Rajghat sometime, why do we want to be famous? And he answers again, it's an excerpt. If you are known all over the world, you feel very important. It gives you a sense of immortality. You want to be famous. You want to be known and talked about in the world because inside yourself, you are nobody. Inwardly, there is no richness. There is nothing there at all. Therefore, you want to be known in the world outside. But if you are inwardly rich, then it does not matter to you whether you are known or unknown. To be inwardly rich is much more arduous than to be outwardly rich and famous. It needs much more care, much closer attention. If you have a little talent and know how to exploit it, you become famous. But inward richness does not come about in that way. To be inwardly rich, the mind has to understand and put away the things that are not important, like wanting to be famous. Inward richness implies standing alone, but the man who wants to be famous is afraid to stand alone because it depends on people's flattery and good opinion. So, I ask now again, is there an attitude, uh, antidote to all this? We seem unable to see ourselves as we actually are. As long as there is identification, whether with our own talent at the small level or with nation, with ideology and so on, as long as there are beliefs and dependence on authority, we cannot have peace. So what will quench the aggression what is going to quench this violence within us, this desire for self-expansion? And a hint perhaps has come in that passage, which I just read out. Is it inner richness? Is that the, the, the thing that we need to really find, to look for? And if it is, what will bring that about? Where will that come from? 
Of course, a related question arises. Can inner richness be sought at all? Is it something within that domain? Because what we know, actually, our, our actual lived experience is not inner richness, but inner poverty. What we know is only our identification with you know, various things, with ideals and beliefs and our self-fulfillment and our personal memories and so on. But we find it very difficult to actually face our inner emptiness. In fact, that's a great art, I think, to be actually able to see inside and not run away from what we see. So is there a possibility of not escaping from our inner poverty? Maybe we will learn something of immense importance that way. Just in passing, I am quoting something from the famous naturalist writer, Rachel Carson, one of the most remarkable environmentalists of the last century. She says, I sincerely believe for the, that for the child, it is not half so important to know as to feel. And if facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions and the impressions of the senses are the fertile soil in which these seeds must grow. So why have I quoted this passage here? I think it's an attempt to ask, answer this question. What is going to bring about inner richness? It's a huge question. Or going back to that earlier thing, what is going to bring about that love for Jyoti, that love for, for truth? How, does, how is that going to come about? Is it going to come about through what is pointed out here, which connects immediately with you know, the art of listening, the art of seeing, the art of learning, which Krishnaji has pointed out. And here's something which, uh, which is a very moving response which Krishnamurti gave to a child who asked him, why do birds fly away when I come near? Just look at his response. How nice it would be if the birds did not fly away when you came near. If you could touch them, be friendly with them, how lovely it would be. But you see, we human beings are cruel people. We kill the birds, torture them, we catch them in nets and put them in cages. Think of a lovely parrot in a cage. Every evening it calls to its mate and sees the other birds flying across the open sky. When we do all these things to the birds, do you think they will not be frightened when we come near them? But if you sit quietly in an isolated spot and are very still, really gentle, you will soon find that the birds come to you. They hover quite close and you can observe their alert movements, their delicate claws, the extraordinary strength and beauty of their feathers. But to do that, you must have immense patience, which means also that you must have a great deal of love and there must be no fear. Animals seem to sense fear in us and they in turn get frightened and run away. That is why it is very important to understand oneself. You try sitting very still under a tree, but not just for two or three minutes because the birds won't get to, used to you in so short a time. Go and sit quietly under the same tree every day and you will soon begin to be aware that everything around you is living. You will see the blades of grass sparkling in the sunshine, the ceaseless activity of the little birds, the extraordinary sheen of a snake or a kite flying high in the sky enjoying the breeze without a movement of its wings. But to see all this and to feel the joy of it, you must have real quietness inside you. So I've come to the end now. I'm just going to list some questions here for us to consider. We need not stick to just these questions. I'm sure many other questions could come up because really this question of peace among us, conflict among us is a huge question, huge issue. What does it mean to not face when we, when we are unable to face our inner poverty?
poverty? What does it mean to face our inner poverty? How do we actually look at it? What does it mean to understand the true place of knowledge? That was listed as one of the things which, which your, we have, which schooling is about to understand the true place of knowledge, where knowledge is relevant and where it is irrelevant. If one is in touch with living beings, with nature, with the soil, will that really quench our aggression? Will that bring about affection, affection for living beings, for human beings, affection for nature? Will it bring about inner richness? That is what apparently is being suggested by these passages. But we will have to test that out. Is this true? We'll have to find out from our own experience, our experience with children. You know, is, is it so that if, if, we, if our senses really flower in this manner that is being suggested, will it, will it do something fundamental to us? And finally, Krishnamurti placed great emphasis on the art of listening, and the art of seeing and the art of learning. How are these arts, learning these arts, of going to affect the war in our everyday lives. For example, if you consider the art of listening, today there is such an acute lack of listening in society. In fact, there is only shouting going on. There is hardly any attempt made to, to, listen, what, to, to listen to what someone has to say. There's only the insistence that you listen to me. And that is, it has become part of our everyday culture. The art of seeing things as they actually are, to be really accurate in our, in our looking, in our perception. And the art of learning, which is learning without the background of conclusions, without the background of images and, and past knowledge which he considered to be the art of learning. If one, has le if one really comes into touch with these arts and they become part of our lives, what will happen to the war in our everyday life? The conflicts which we experience and the conflicts which we carry over to the mass level. So I've kept these questions and just one last closing slide out here in which Krishna Deek talked about being a light to yourself. And it nicely connects with that, that verse of, uh, you know, which I quoted our assembly song. He talked about being a light to yourself. And we, we should ask ourselves, what can we do that will nurture such a state of being? When you are light, a light to yourself, you are a light to the world. Because the world is you and you are the world. So that's the end of my piece. So just to, I'll close it here. I can always open it later. So what is it that I am, I have tried to communicate here? That if there is lack of peace in the world, it emanates directly from our, from our nature from our, our habit of identification, from the aggression and violence that we seem to carry in us and which is very ancient, from our collective obsessions with things which are of very little importance, and perhaps from our attachment to fictional knowledge, fictional reality, all these make an extraordinarily toxic mix and is, it's a self-supporting uh, system which, which keeps the violence in the world going, I think. And unless we are able to come to terms with it, unless we are able to really understand it, it doesn't seem that things are going to change very much. So it's a vast problem. If we have to set, if we have to tackle it at the school level, we have to talk about the art of listening, the art of seeing. We have to 
come, we have to nurture in the child the ability to, to not identify with fictions. So there's so many things which really form part of this work. Okay, so I'll stop now. Uh, Purli. So uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, would you like to start sharing the screen with the other PDF right now? Or would you like to take up uh, some viewpoints, questions from our participants? I based just, on... Yeah, I'll just locate the thing. One minute, please. Sorry, if, would you like to go on? Would you ha have anything? Um, yeah, I, I can see three people already interested in interacting with you. Uh, so shall we give them a chance sir, to start? Yeah, I'll, I, I'll just show you the pieces. Uh, okay, just before we do that, yeah. I can just quickly share one piece. For example, yeah. this is that piece which I referred to, where he talks of what is the significance of history in the education of the young. And uh, well, I have already quoted some passages from that, so I need not go on here. Then another piece, which is uh, which is perhaps not so familiar, uh, here, it's very interesting. But he, someone asks him, as a student, in fact, how can we create the feeling for necessity of manual work? Hmm? And the title of this piece is "When You Do Not Know." When we do not know inward richness, we pursue superficial riches. And look at the, the last parag paragraph of this. This is, hmm? those people who refuse to touch the earth, the flower, do not know what they miss. If you really went into the garden, dug and planted, saw things grow, if you milked a cow, looked after chickens, something happens to you. There's an astonishing richness in it. Those who have no touch with the earth miss a great deal. Try and have a garden of your own, plant a tree of your own, organize it. Then you will see what happens to you inwardly. It gives you a sense of release, beauty, the love of the earth, the of the little worms inside the earth. But unfortunately, we do not know that feeling. Nor do we know the feeling of sitting still and looking on something actually. We know none of this inward richness and not knowing we acquire superficial transient riches. So I think all these, these pieces which have been, you know, I think they need to be very carefully studied and to see how, how they can be brought, made part of our lives and part of children's lives so that we don't carry false values into, our, into the world. Okay, I'll stop now. I think uh, I have spoken enough. <laughs> Would One you like to direct the questions? Uh, you choose, uh, Murli. Okay, I, I really would like to uh, listen to um, you know uh, some of our participants who are already there. But uh, sirs, I have a request: very brief uh, with your point, so that more people can participate. Uh, I can see M who wanted to ask the question first. Please unmute and raise your hand, sir. So I am Mohan, sir. Can you listen to me, sir? Yes, sir. Audible? Go ahead. Sir, I, I listened to your talk. was very, very good. Fantastic. Sir, since you are in contact with the children, students and being a teacher, so this present day students are having very good facilities. A lot of technology has come, come forward for their help, which in our period we lacked. So with all these things, do you think that any hope from this youngsters or students whom we can have some hope in the world to have a better world in this the present situation so can we have a better living place from the youngsters thank you sir well if you're asking me my yes, response would be to that having better facilities and better technology by itself does not create the conditions that we are talking about 
as long as human nature is such that as long as all these earlier the tendencies which we have described as long as they are there they simply find a way of making use of all available technologies if we have a tendency to get obsessed with things which don't really matter and children do just as much as adults the moment a new technology comes we then that becomes the object of our obsession whatever comes our way just just finds its way into the same routine that we are already having so and unfortunately that it is not the answer to the to whatever we are hoping new technology only only allows some new kinds of phenomena like social media for example social media is an enormously powerful tool which has suddenly been invented at some a decade back and of course many nice things can happen through social media but it also becomes like an end in itself and obsession in itself and it can encourage our own vanities our own various kinds of things okay uh kalai vani uh, am i audible yes uh thank you uh, uh mr shirali it was in a uh, uh, very very uh, enlightening session my uh, question is around technology technology has always brought excitement to humans the drastic one happened a couple of decades back the internet with all its uh, conveniences the digital planet yeah. where our kids are born cannot be avoided for the very reason that non digital could also be danger or drawback to their survival into the future the question is how do we empower the future generation with digital value system is there any difference between the physical value system and digital or is there going to be a convergence uh, you know between the physical and uh, digital okay i i have to interpret your question slightly i'm not sure i fully get what you have asked but i do not see of course the the digital medium is enormously powerful and the real question to me is can we make use of that power in a respectful and intelligent way there are great many good things which can be done with mastery of this kind of medium but as long as our other tendencies are um, are still active you know we just find i mean there's the same I, i'm saying the same thing which i answered in the previous few a minute back i'll give you an example in the 1930s uh, radio was still an emerging medium but in the the nazi regime uh, the hitler's people uh, gabels in particular found a very effective way of making use of radio so they used radio for propaganda and this is an example of how you can use technology for your own purposes you know for all of of course there are plenty of good things which can come from technology but for that you one has one needs maturity one needs non identification one needs to be not identified with my own i you know i don't need i should be out of my own identification with my personal fulfillment my ambition so that kind of uh, you know growth is needed uh, in me before that can happen otherwise i will just misuse the digital medium and it can be misused much more dangerously than perhaps the earlier media because it, there are so many potentialities in it which uh, which is emerging now in today's world i'm not sure i've really answered your question but i this is my response rajendra sir yeah uh, i think uh, rajendra wanted to ask he is lost right wait, now wait i am i am clear now yes 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 sir Th thank you thank you sir thank you for your time and uh, happy teachers to uh, many teachers are here happy teachers day sir you you were you mentioned about fiction mm -hmm. it seems to me the uh, the one of the greatest fiction is the me the illusion and the fiction writer is 
nothing other than our own thought. Krishna Ji spent more than 60 years to point out, point out to us the psychological dangers of the thought. But uh, we don't see the dangers of the thought and uh, we don't see the snake in the room. We play with it all the time. And we became the snake. And we are the great worshippers of snake, the Nagaraja. So what do you like to say? Something to those of us who worship the thought and, who, and play with the snake. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's a very uh, perceptive uh, remark that you've made that the greatest fiction is, is the self, the me. Uh, indeed, you're absolutely right. But to, to go deeper into it, I think we have to understand <clears throat> the nature of that, uh, that self and see it in terms of its actual expression uh, and how a child growing up will perhaps not be so attached to himself or herself. I think if you look at it, let's say I have a talent. Let's say I'm a child and I have a talent. What is my attitude to that talent? What, what is the, you know, it just so, supposing it happens that I can run faster than all the others in my class, or I can draw better than anybody else. What is the, it's a gift, right? Uh, I didn't create that, that gift. It just came to me. It came, I was born with it. But what's my attitude to it? Am I encouraged to regard it as, as a personal possession? Am I encouraged to sort of uh, talk about it and make my make everybody know about it? I think it's very important when a child is growing up, what kind of a relationship he has with a talent that he has. Because that's one of the first acts of identification. And it goes the flip way also. What if I don't have talent? What is the, do I identify with that lack of talent? Do I feel ashamed of it? Do I develop an inferiority complex? So the sense of, of me is, is a very, it's a very subtle and very deep one, but, but one of the things that, that contributes to it is identification with my own, uh, with things, with aspects of myself. It could be talents, it could be lack of talent, it could be of, of, of coming from a particular part of the world. You know, there are a variety of ways and we, uh, so the society at the moment is structured in such a way that it actually strengthens your identification with each of these. So, but as you said, this is an ancient fiction, the sense of me. Uh, we don't quite know how old it is, but it has been with us for a long time. But it cannot, it is of a, such a subtle nature that I think one can only talk about it by seeing its expression, which is identification with specific things like uh, my memory of, of people, my psychological memory of of hurts, my psychological memory of my, my accomplishments, my talents, and all these things. So unless we are, we can, we can see these things, not only see these things, but see that they are the cause of conflict. The moment I say I, it's my talent, I am, look at my, how superior I am. The moment I, I have, if I can see for myself, the destructive nature of that that thought, even if I don't say it out aloud, that it has a destructive nature. And I think we have to somehow create an environment where we are able to see such a thing, which requires a great, very sensitive uh, atmosphere and a, a great sensitivity on the part of the teacher or the parent that a child can see such a thing and not develop this you know, narcissistic, that falling in love with your own talent, your own accomplishment and so on. It's a vast question that you have asked. I think this, this is one aspect that I can answer about, but this identification with me is a, 
is a huge question. Thank you, sir. That is very teacher specific, you, the way you came in. Uh, Kekul, it's your uh, question now. Uh, greetings, everyone. And I consider myself privileged to be part of this conversation on this very special occasion of Teachers Day. Uh, I am uh, part of an institution which is, uh, you know, my role is creating the institution. And then uh, many times I come across students, uh, you know, who are very intelligent, but are very much at ease, very much content with whatever they have. And, that, and sometimes I feel that because of the same reason, they don't have the ambition, ambition or zeal to do something or the instinct to go ahead and achieve things, which, uh, you know, is requirement of the society. But when I look at them, I feel they are going to do great because they are already happy. They, they are happy with what they have and they don't desire things, which is actually a problem in our life. You know, everything that, you know, as you were also sharing the fiction and the kind of reality that we imagine and things that we look for. So uh, as, a, as a teacher, do we continue to allow these children to be okay or happy with what they have or should we push them to go to that next level so that they can become even better or they can achieve things in life? That's my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, I mean, there are many issues involved in this question. It, you know, connect, it is connected with this question of ambition, this question of drive. I certainly think it is part of a teacher's work to, to work with children and to, to nurture this feeling of this love of excellence, this love of beauty, this love of doing something beautifully. I think it's a very important uh, quality. And if we can do it without, uh, not in the spirit of identification, but to do something because it has, it has beauty, it, there is possibility of share, you know, bringing in others into it so that it, it can actually be expressed that way. So love of, of excellence, I think is very important. And I think it is part of the teacher's work to see that you, you don't you don't just sit in your comfort zone and you you, you challenge yourself. You're, you're in a you know spirit of learning to see, find your own limits and find something which you don't know or you're not able to tackle. Uh, and you discover it without a sense of shame or identification. So certainly I think it is a part of a teacher's work. Incidentally, connected with the previous point. I would also like to say this, that one direct consequence of, of identification with talent is when you start to put talent to the use of a nation. When a nation or a corporation starts to make use of your brilliance, your talent, to just for its personal profit or for the expansion is expansion of the nation. I think this, this can result in extremely deadly things. Supposing, for example, I happen to be tremendously brilliant and I have the capacity to create a very powerful bomb. I am brilliant enough to, to be able to put together some materials which will be enormously destructive. Now, what do I do with this, this kind of a talent that I have when I understand materials so well that I can create some something deadly out of it. What's my responsibility? As long as I am identified with it, I will only think of it through pride. Oh, look, oh, look at what a great thing I can do. You know, it, it, my name will be associated with it. Or I link it with, with an ideology or a country. I build it in the name of a, a country that my country will, will prosper, will crush the other country and so on. I think it's, it's a, it has far more importance than we realize, this non-identification with a personal gift and to see that it doesn't belong to any person or to any society, any country. Uh, Mr. Thank, you, Thank you. Mr. Uh, Pradeep, would you like to? Yes. Uh, thank you, Murli ji. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Shiradi, for uh, your sharing this morning. Uh, 
I'd like to make an observation uh, and then come to another point. My observation is uh, around a question a previous uh, questioner had asked about technology. Uh, and I believe technology is also a tool that uh, kind of perpetuates the fiction we are talking about. So if you look at things that are happening currently, uh, all our children, children of the valley are engaged through a virtual platform that is taking them away from the reality that is taking them away from what the valley promises and away from that very wonderful statement you had from Krishnaji about uh, being able to enjoy nature, being able to have that bird come and sit next to me. So I think with this virtual setup that we have, it is taking our children far away from that ability to perceive that ability to be a part of nature. Uh, that said, uh, we have talked about macroscopic events. Uh, I appreciate your tracing historical events as well. Uh, I'd like to kind of suggest that we bring things to a microscopic level as well. Uh, what can we do as individuals? What can we do as uh, educators as well? Uh, and I think you mentioned that study, that inner observance, that uh, ability to, to connect. Uh, and I sometimes see a disconnect uh, as individuals, as educators, uh, the game of one-upmanship continues. Uh, we perpetuate uh, various things. So how can we as individuals, as educators, as uh, the Krishnamurti Foundation organizations kind of convey this message? Because if we talk about consumerism on a lighter side, if you come to an event at the Valley School, uh, you will see a very nice display of all the logos you will see a very nice array of the latest and the greatest in terms of luxury cars and the such. Uh, and I understand that the desire is not to create an echo chamber by attracting people of uh, similar mindset, but how is it that we can promote, how can we get our children and our parents and everyone to make the change, right? If the change starts with us, then we can make it a better one. What do we do as educators, sir? Yeah, I, I answered your question. It's a it's a tough question. Uh, this <clears throat> what basically you're asking what what is our actual work, uh, the content of our actual relationship and work with children, in terms of our what we talk with them, what we point out to them. I think I, all the things that you know that were mentioned in this in those slides, we have to somehow make them alive, because I think if we just take this one question of this quality of inner richness, what will create what what kind of things can I do with children? that will make this inner richness come alive that so that there is there is an understanding of the things that are happening inside me so i no longer depend on things the way i used to can i become more aware of my own impulses the hidden way in which i have been op operating or acting I think if you are, when you're asking what can we as educators do, the first thing is that we have to understand these things for ourselves. Of course, I've been mentioning the children repeatedly, but even before that, I have to ask this question of myself and become aware of my own, uh, my own impulses. And maybe I can, you know, I may be even, I may even talk about them to the children that see this, Let's examine the way in which we are influenced and which we, uh, the way we try to, to uh, what's the right word? The way we try to project ourselves in the world and convey a certain kind of image, the way we hold on to our uh, achievements. We all have these tendencies. Every single individual has it 
to some extent to the other Excuse and me. can we learn from our from our tendencies and so this is not a prescriptive thing that we have to tell the children not to do something that should that's completely pointless i think these things are not going to go away by by uh, you know you can't pass a law that you should not do something we have it can only be through uh, through a process of exploration through a process of looking through a process of seeing ourselves actually uh, you know in action how these things are operating in our relationship our tendency to project our tendency to hide certain things our tendency to boast uh, you know whether it is physical the material possessions or some talent that we have so mutually it has to happen between the educator and the child there has to be that that very living rich conversation which is happening in which without any reservation all these things are being explored so that i think it's in that atmosphere of security that there's a possibility to me it seems of the child Uh, blossoming flowering so that you are able to see your own traits you are able to see yourself and you are not uh, holding on to an image of yourself after that you know see your question also like the previous one it's a very deep question there's no simple straightforward answer to it but these are just some things which uh, which occurred to me so if i were to summarize then the best teaching would be in our living uh, and how as parents and educators we go about our lives so sure sure thank you pradeep also conversing about them we have to talk about them so that the subtler aspects come out and we we see for ourselves what what all the, what they involve so it's not that we so we should not make the danger of trying to make ourselves into examples hmm? that we live a certain way and then ask others to copy us it's not that kind of thing it's an exploration and an attempt to understand for ourselves the nature of our own being so mutually we have to do it along with the children yes murli yes anand about that one apprenticeship anand please go ahead yes sir so that was a lovely speech sir that, that was absolutely great uh, i i'm just observing what krishnamurthy has said sir mm-hmm. he has said that if we have lost relationship with nature we cannot be related to man that sounds very profound and more than 2000 uh, years uh, ago i mean we had pythagoras who said as long as man continues to be ruthless destroyer of uh, destroyer of lower beings he will never know health or peace for as long as man massacres animals they will kill each other indeed he who sows the seeds of murder and pain cannot reap joy and love and all the violence which is taking place on this planet sir again i, I have a question like there is uh, there's no security in life and we are se- seeking security all the time and the desire for my security seems to be the cause for all the violence which is taking place can i observe that is a question sir over sir yes you have asked two things the first th- point is very profound and uh, it's uh, rather than take it as a as just a statement i think it's an opportunity to explore for ourselves why in what way it is is it true if you lose relationship with nature what happens what is the consequence of that if to lose relationship with nature essentially means to lose relationship with you know with life itself because nature is life for around to to not see uh, the life in the insects the the trees around us the grass the leaves and i think what is the state of mind which creates that we have to understand for ourselves in why in what way uh, how does one reach that point of that kind of a situation where you are unrelated to nature which means what nature has become only an object which you uh, which you exploit for your own uh, comfort for whatever for furthering your own uh, 
um, ego or your own nationalistic ambitions or your aggression, whatever it is, some something. Nature has only become a resource, a resource that's a very top modern word. It's just a re seen as a resource. And I think it, if you go one step prior to that, it means that we have already we have already separated ourselves to be able to say of nature that nature is just a resource which we should make use of so that my own comfort is maximized, my own uh, success is maximized and so on. So, and when that happens, the moment I have cut myself off, I have already isolated myself from, from life. I think it's going to happen with human beings as well. Because the moment I have, I have stepped away, I have become like an, like an unconnected uh, individual, equally will I be unconnected with other human beings. So I think to be actually, actually able to see that phenomenon happening, to see how I can get into a state of mind in which nature is just a resource, nature is just there to be exploited. I have to be able to understand what I have done to myself, what I regard myself as, that we are just here. And of course, I need not be just the individual I, it could be, it could be a group also, it could be a, a corporation, a nation and so on. So it, it's very interesting, this, uh, this observation, it's a very deep observation and it should not be, I'm glad you pointed out to it because it should not be just taken as one more of those statements. There is there's an opportunity for great exploration in it. Even historically, I think you can find how, how it has manifested in history. Um, for example, I, I believe in history, I've, I've read it somewhere, that some of the forests around the Mediterranean, which grow in Northern Africa and Southern parts of Europe, were completely destroyed as a result of all the timber being used for ships. For, and those ships were basically instruments of war, ships which are part of war. So here's an example of how a direct consequence happens. You want to make use of things simply for aggressive means. And of course it has immense consequences. That just, this is just one isolate, one small example, which actually is a big example, but these kinds of things have happened so often in history. Okay, and I was responding to the first thing that you asked. I think you asked a second point also. I'm afraid I lost. <laughs> uh, that is, sir, life does not exist. Uh, I mean, there is insecurity in life, sir. Can I understand ah, yes. that? Yeah, to <laughs> what, that's a, again an, a very major issue. What, to actually understand my own experience of insecurity to actually realize that I feel insecure. That's not a trivial statement because I sometimes I may have insecurity about of which I am not even aware. It only manifests in my relationships, in my actions, in my dreams and so on, but I'm not aware of, of insecurity. To, to actually be in, aware of insecurity uh, which means I am depending on some person, I am depending on some property, I am depending on some state of affairs which I have got completely used to. So to actually realize for myself all that, then I can comprehend my own uh, insecurity. I think we are, we are actually quite far, far from that. We don't actually uh, uh, we are not sufficiently in touch with our own insecurity. So how does security come about? How does insecurity come about? Okay, let me just, uh, uh, I think I'll just take a small break at here. I'll may, maybe I'll respond to that question later in this session. Uh, yes, right sir. Now, all right. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Solochan, uh, would you like to ask here? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. No, today's um, talk uh, uh, about the present crisis, whether we're able to live 
uh, whether we could live peacefully on this earth. It's a very uh, uh, core of the crisis that we are undergoing currently. So it was an amazing uh, presentation uh, which touches the core of the crisis uh, vis a vis uh, JK's teachings and vision. Somewhere, uh, you know, Somewhere in your slides, I saw your very uh, once word, mm -hmm. inner poverty. Huh. So that's a very amazing uh, word. That answer, that is the core, that is the, uh, that is the answer for everything. See, in the present day, uh, the aggression and violence is the rule of law in the name of peace and justice. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, the inner poverty, that is the point, that is the punchline. Please uh, throw some light on this. Thank you. Well, uh, inner poverty, of course, is a, is a description. It may seem like, um, like you're, you're actually commenting on the absence of something. You're looking inside and seeing that there is nothing there. And, and so being aware that that I have got, I have so little in me which is original. I hold on to things. Symbols start to become tremendously important. The, the history of my country becomes very important. My national flag becomes very important. The name of my religion becomes very important. Or some piece of property that I have becomes very important. Things become important to me which actually are unimportant, but they become tremendously important to me because that's all I seem to have. I don't seem to have anything else. I, you know, I, I'm just clinging, it's like clinging to straws. So it, it exposes deep down a very, uh, an inner insecurity that if I, I have this dim feeling inside me about of which I may not even be conscious that if I let go of them, I am nothing. I'm, I become nothing at all. I lose all my, uh, my very uh, rationale for existence. So I cling to things and they become tremendously important, uh, important. I become dependent on them. When they are, uh, when they are threatened, I become violent. I can do terrible things in the name of defending the things which are attacked. So all these things result from, from this, uh, inner lack. So that's why this question comes up. What will naturally and sweetly, as Krishna Ji often used to use that word, what will bring about this inner richness, which cannot be put in artificially? I cannot take something and put it into my either myself or a child in the, and call it inner richness. And that's why this question has, has at this point has been brought out so strongly? Does it lie in learning the art of listening, the art of learning, the art of seeing? Because when you see something originally, see something actually for, with your own eyes, when you understand something by directly coming in touch into contact with it, then that observation is part of you. That observation is you in a way. And that I think it is, it is that kind of an observation, original observation, which is the fundamental, which is the basis of perhaps of richness, where you, you actually are, you know, you're, you have some solidity from inside. It is built out of your actual contact with the world and not with the symbol. If we are filled with symbols and fictional things, we are deep down, we are empty. And maybe very deep, dimly inside, we realize that we are empty, which is why we become so violent when that symbol is threatened. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Sir. Ajay Dalmia. Unmute yourself, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Shirali, I have, a, I have a question on your observation or your, on your note about the developing the art of listening and the art of seeing. And I would say in this uh, 
in this era where speed is the thing and and moving ahead fast and also the digital world how do you develop this as a part of the learning process the art of listening and the art of seeing along with getting connected to the soil or the earth well again, then this directly takes one to what happens in a school what happens in a, a classroom can we start to give much more importance to to things that children actually see and touch and so that their own their own actual observation is is given highest uh, priority and of course uh, ob- we should not make the mistake of imagining that observation is only external once you you know as your ability to see something deepens then you you may also be able to look inwards with that same quality so to be able to see something and to not you know there is that term called book knowledge you know many many people are book you know their learning is just theories based it's just knowledge which has been borrowed which you borrow it from textbooks borrow from encyclopedias internet whatever and we have a culture today which actually values uh, that kind of knowledge you know quickly answering uh, things everything is fact based our education system itself may be emphasizing that kind of thing uh, to give an extreme example of that the answer to a, a question should be exactly what is stated in the textbook you know that would be the most uh, grotesque form of that just answer means it should be exactly the same as a textbook so that means th- you are living a kind of artificial world in which artificial life in which uh, you know it's only things which are contained in the book have some are given some value so the only antidote for that would be right from the beginning to start giving emphasis to your own senses this is not a, a trivial task i think it's a very complex task because we are already even children come to school conditioned they have already got used to it and we you will often find this uh, this peculiar contradiction that if a child sees something and then find something in a book which contradicts what he has seen he will believe the book and not his own seeing he, you know he will give seem there is more faith in what you you read in a book so this is an example of how we start becoming dependent on on you know external sources in that in a way so how can it how can we sort of turn this thing inside out so that our own observation starts to become the the primary thing and of course finally we have to be able to look at ourselves to look at to look at my own um what my own violence say or the question was asked about inner poverty how will i look at my own identification with symbols the fact that i give tremendous importance to symbols to even be able to be able to look at that itself is is not trivial because i will be scared to look at it thank you sir priyadarshini uh, thank you sir uh, so my question is um, can we assume that fear is the driving force behind most of our fictionalized behaviors like our need to conform how do we cultivate this fearless person in the young without creating the unnecessary aggression fear fear is another major area for exploration and there may be basis for deep fears which we are not really aware of but you can clearly see 
that dependence on on certain kinds of things itself creates fears you start to depend on things and then uh, they become tremendously important to your own feeling of security so it's not um, fictional reality comes a little bit later perhaps not for a not for the small child so much it you as as one grows up these fictional realities start to become more and more important and ultimately they start to become in fact more important than the physical world itself we start to live in that a uh, fictional world so how does how does a parent or a teacher cope with fear i think that's an immense question something which we have to i don't easily have um, i don't have a quick response to it but certainly one of the first things i think we have to be able to do is to actually see for ourselves to come as close to fear as possible and to really understand what is it we are afraid of which in the very nature of fear is that you are not able to look at it you are afraid even to look at it that's that's contained in the fear itself but to be able to come close to it and understand um understand its smell so to speak its taste as krishna ji once referred to in one conversation with children he asked what is the taste of fear i think we can we have to really in in intimate conversation with children ask them to to experience what it feels like what what is the what does it do to us and what you know what does it rest on what are we afraid of giving up because there has we may mix up many different kinds of fears when we talk of fear if i have fear of darkness fear of ghosts Uh, that may be an entirely different kind of fear or fear that i will lose my parents that has become very real in today's world the covid world for children so child the fears that children feel i think are of are of a very wide variety let's take something which is much more which they begin to start to feel as they are growing up the fear of public opinion how does that actually happen to be able to experience for ourselves the fear of be a fear of disapproval the fear that uh, that some the opinion the the leading people in the class will have a bad opinion about them thank you sir i think there's a there's a question which is which needs to be uh, it needs much closer exploration i don't think i can i can really answer this question it's a very deep question how do you tackle how, not tackle how do you address fear uh, how do you discuss fear with children because it it requires looking at uh, at their individual fears and to see to to discern whether it is a a physical fear or a fear which is based on a fiction maybe my my reputation my good name there are you know we have to be able to see it very finely i i'm afraid i can't answer it fully right now i'll stop here yes sir mm. uh, we may need another session you know two hour <laughs> session for that it is such an important question uh, sudhir sharma would you like to join thank you sir so my question is uh, related to the resolving of the relationship issues mm. uh, we we understand the problem we analyze it 
we put in efforts we put in actions but things are constantly moving from bad to worse in my outer world same thing happens with my inner world also i understand various issues of the self and i analyze them also i discuss them but still i am not changing so uh, in in resolving the issues could it be that uh, the solution is already present in us and it is just lying dormant it has to be activated and whatever we do even if we take a one simple step in resolving the problem in the outer world or the inner world then that that actual solution to the problem stays dormant inactive Mm-hmm. Yes, quite right. I think. I think. I'd like to just make a different remark, not exactly stemming from what you have asked, but we need to really understand for ourselves why certain phenomena are becoming so important in the world, and in what way they are connected with this. with this demand in us for preservation of certain symbols certain ideas for example this whole um a, a, an attitude to authority an attitude to authoritarianism or an attitude to fundamentalism these are very these are very relevant issues right here in our country today so unless we are able to see our own dependence on symbols and of course children learn these things from adults it's not that they are very much dependent on these things but they just it's like a borrowed feeling you know they they listen to adults talking about it and they say yes yes it must be it must be that way and they simply swallow it not that they have any feeling about it ultimately it goes deep in and then Uh, that becomes part of uh, part of our whole mental makeup so this is it's like a complicated um, relationship which we have created in which problems get get multiplied problems get frozen in time and space by our own attitude so well unless we are prepared to do it at the talk about it more and break our own dependence on myths and symbols and fictions i think we are not there doesn't seem much hope for uh, for uh, movement really and we have to somehow bring that culture into our country a greater conversation around these things a greater awareness that there are things which are fictions and we are giving them tremendous importance and why should we do that can because we are so much in the habit of trying to solve everything through through legal means or political means everything has to be fixed through some mechanism uh which may be a legal mechanism or constitution or you know everything has to be fixed by some uh in by a mechanical way so in fact the term that i like to use for this is social engineering it's all engineering mechanics you put a force here put a force there and try to adjust all the problems but that kind of approach in a way we are seeing all over the world that that kind of approach has its limits and ultimately it leads to difficulties but perhaps what is happening in the western world is a much more much greater demonstration of the fact that it's a very limited approach you can try to fix everything through these mechanical ways you know mechanical model for society but it it fails ultimately because we we have not come to terms with our own uh, demand for fictional reality uh, you know, yeah, to understand that Burli, if we are reaching the end of our session, yeah, I think uh, I'd like to share that significance of history together. We can just read it together, and then we can close after that. 
Uh, Whenever we, as a, as we are closing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I wanted to actually request you that we have three more people: Shiva Kumar, Sushmanti, Ishan, and Shamal Rao. We will end the session with this, uh, you know, four people, and uh, we will end with what you would like to share. Will that be fine, sir? It may cross a little. Well, uh, yeah. That's fine. Yes. Ish Shiva Kumar, please ask your question. Ask your question. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Am I audible? <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, being Teachers' Day and more teachers being present here, I would like to share a couple of thoughts here. Yeah. A speaker has addressed this question on use of technology for students beautifully. I don't have a second thought on that. However, the question by Kalawani and a few other teachers, uh, I feel it is a very important question. We are in a period where technology can't be taken away from kids and isolate them totally. Instead, we should strongly address and find innovative ways on how technology can be utilized with a clear understanding of the limitation it poses to understand oneself and technology, how it takes away us from nature. Here, I would like to quote K, the purpose, the aim and drive of these schools these schools, he means K schools. The purpose, the aim, and drive of these schools is to equip the child with the most excellent technological proficiency so that he may function with clarity and efficiency in the modern world. And for more important, to create the right kind of climate so that the child may develop fully as a complete human being. So uh, in this regard, I would like to uh, give one example. I, how I personally use technology uh, with students okay, in an alternative school, which I have been guiding for quite some time. Of course, here our students don't have exams. Okay, they don't have separate classes as such. They spend more time in nature. They grow organic food. Okay, they spend more time with animals, cattle, so many other things, okay, which they are spending more time here. Right? But what I did is, like, you know, I, I also wanted not them to be isolated from the world. So what I used is I used Skype, okay? just like what we are using Zoom to interact. Now the Zoom is not interfering in this discussion, what we are saying, what we are discussing. It is just a tool, like the way we use a book or pen or any other thing. Of course, there are certain uh, uh, problems associated with it, which we have to be careful. But always, just like a book and pen, I use a Skype and made the students to in remote town in Nellore, that is Kavli, to build a relation with students in 72 countries, where kids could understand firsthand the cultural difference, the different perceptions kids worldwide have, so many things, okay? But then here, the, there was no interaction between the teachers. It was only the kids interacting with other kids, and of course, it's a limitation, just a 45 minutes once in a week. And of course, we also had an option like, you know, bring your own device once in a month, but just for 30 minutes. Okay, so that is, and how, how to utilize it was like, you know, explored by the students. Okay, so uh, what, what I feel is like, you know, uh, today we, we, it is natural tendency among the teachers. Okay, let's remove the kids. Like now we see like, you know, right, not only for the kids, even the babies today, they spend more time with the instruments than their parents. Okay, what is it that is attracting? Okay, what is that is holding them? Okay, what is it that is making these kids so interested in the technology? So interested, what is it that captures them? So if you understand that and divert that and bring that kind of attention in the nature, I probably like, you know, uh, technology can be harnessed in a beautiful way. So this is what I would like to share. Of course, there are various other ways, but straight away, like, you know, uh, being in the 21st century and today they have to be in this world. They can't be in some other world. They, they in one or the other way, they will be part of the technology. At that time, they should not face like, you know, okay, well, and in fact, most of the misuse of the technology today is happening in the uh, schools is only because there is no proper guidance on how to utilize it in a proper way. So one should not uh, like, you know, move away from this or shy away from that, but then one has to address this in a very uh, uh, understanding way and try to bring the, what K says, okay, utilizing this thing. That's what I would like to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I agree completely that as long as I think one, there is the possibility of making excellent use of technology when I'm not trying to, when I'm not caught in self-expansion, 
when if then there's a beauty Te technology can be a beautiful thing to use when i am when i use it strictly for the purpose for which it is for which it was made and of course then i will also be very sensitive and not create technologies which are destructive because typically destructive technologies are created out of this whole uh, aggressive uh, attitude attitude so certainly there's no question yeah, no question yeah i would like to add just one sentence here in fact the alumni of pistamurti school i think from boy or brockwood okay they have created one beautiful game called flower you must be knowing flower okay so where this game of course is a very popular game but no kind of violence no kind of any other things which typically the games has so they, that is a wonderful thing and it was one of the top five games okay were created by this alumni it's called flowers and of course they have another two games which are created so i just thought i'll point it out thank you thank you uh, sushmanti would you like to uh, join it is almost uh, 12 we have two more people or uh, there's a request for one more person please go yeah. ahead sushmanti yeah see shailesh it's a very brief question but i must say that it was a very eye opener and very beautiful session you have uh, conducted uh, see i just my uh, feeling that see we can easily see the disadvantage of nations and then the falsity of nations we can see that falsity of religions also similarly at this point of time we feel that the technology is very important but is technology becoming another god and somewhere actually it is giving us comfort it is giving us so many things that is true but technology is basically created for the sense for war and for the uh, uh, instruments of the war and uh, the by product of it is the comfort and other things which we are getting out of this technology so is so much of technology really necessary for the human being or we are just blindly following the technology and trying to really achieve something in technology oh yeah you are right um, there are many many technological technological advances which have come about directly because of war uh, many things were discovered during world war 2 and so on even world war 1 so and of course uh, and also the cold war so this it is a fact of life that of and many years later those same things may may even have some peaceful applications so people may say oh there are peaceful applications which can come out of this also but it is a fact that uh, you know that so many of our technologies have come about through violent beginnings so we have i don't know what can we, we many of these technologies probably are unnecessary in life you know we have created our own dependence on them and once they are in our hands then we start becoming more and more psychologically dependent on them they become ways of of strengthening our own self image or strengthening our own vanity so as long as we are caught in that kind of technological trap where it is just feeding into our own self image in some way we will continue to misuse it i think our very creation of certain certain kinds of technology has come about in through our through aggressive and violent ways and then we become further dependent on them it's unfortunate that such a state of affairs has come about and i think the cycle can be broken only if there is if there is not such a great attachment on our habit of self projection on our own vanity then we will create technologies which are really which have value which have you know which are not destructive i don't have a, i mean i'll just say that i won't say anything more. no i think just the deeper question is is technology so much of technology necessary for self exploration and mostly the answer would be no so yeah, quite right quite right much of technology is created in fact out of an obsession with some of these things which were described earlier uh, and they each each of them can become obsessions in themselves technology itself can become an obsession you want more and more and more of something 
and uh, it can become like a it takes you away it, it's a kind of maya you you're just you know carried further away and further and further away from the most important things of life you know, I, I agree completely so unless we are we have that inner wisdom and we are able to give the right place to technology in our lives it will start to dominate us thank you very much sir actually since it is uh, past 12 i just have one request can we just ask three people just to say what they want and i request ishan shamal rao and rajati to be very brief then we have some time to wind up with the slides which you have in mind is that okay yeah so we will listen to ishan followed by shamal rao shankar and rajati but request you just one minute each please ishan to start with uh, good morning sirs and ma'ams and happy teachers day uh, shirali sir i had one question that how does um, privilege tie or security tie into this whole conversation because uh, privilege or security i might have financial or educational or with knowledge and how does how did it tie into i can think of the world as being fictional we have we've created these fictional things like money and all but if you have somebody coming in from the rural areas to the city trying to earn his days living to improve his security and his family security how does i mean for him those those comforts would be would give him inner happiness correct mm -hmm. thank yes. you um shall we have shamal rao uh, would you like to share your point sir thank you so much sir thank you happy teachers day sir and thank you for the brilliant discourse and at the risk of running a repetition i find digital technology addictive and very manipulative of young mind the extraordinary micro power of technology has completely overtaken the young micro mind the situation is distressing and the behavioral changes in them which i had the opportunity to observe from very close quarters my associates with two of young kids they are very disturbing these are the points i had in my mind when i wanted to when i raised my hand to ask i find that sri sailesh has very well covered this part and i think thank you especially for this and thank you also to you sir thank you thank you uh, shankar you want to add something yeah good morning shailesh ji uh, you are the only speaker who came with so beautifully slides and all that uh, my question is uh, Um, I have a 20 year old child, 20 years, and uh, he studied in KFI school for five years. Uh, I am unable to explain him that uh, this greed, selfishness, jealousy, these fictions, as you mentioned, money, nationality, ideologies, they all created from thought, uh, and he is unable to understand that. And uh, uh, he has one big fear in his life. Yesterday night, I was discussing till night two o'clock. Uh, dad you should never beat me nobody should beat me in my life if you beat me i cannot take it except that everything i can take it i said fine nobody has beaten you never we will beat you but you will live with this fear of somebody will beat me somebody will beat me all your life so you you have you have to come out of this uh, fear of uh, somebody will beat you some suppose tomorrow some policeman beaten you even a false case or your wife beaten you in future by mistake you will go and commit suicide because of this strong obsession for not getting beaten so i am unable to explain this uh, to him sir uh, this all this is thought created you have to come out of it thank you sir thank you rajati you have a last uh, question just yes, take sir. one minute yes sir exactly one minute good morning everybody uh, sir that's a lovely session thank you so much and uh, my observation sir i work with uh, teachers i work with parents and children so in this new technology driven way of education sir uh, is it possible that the teachers can spend some amount of time because it's teachers day and all of us are here some amount of time uh, even talking to the parents 
so what i feel is i was in a in a in a farm yesterday with my friend who's been living in a farm for two months and uh, that's a dream come true for you know for me because i want my child to be among the nature exactly like what you said and so a 45 minutes uh, online session where the teacher who is actually talking to let's say 10 children or five children asks a question and some of the children brilliantly quickly answer it and uh, my child doesn't answer now so that 45 minutes a parent is sitting along with the child i'm talking about the young ones who are below 7 years below 8 years where the parent is around and there are so many insecurities and conditioning that the parent goes through that sir that 45 minutes stretches to so many hours of forcefully making a child understand the concept so we as teachers sir is it possible for us as much as we are planning our sessions with the children is it possible for us to have a monthly session with a parent or two month session with the parent um, sir i have many of my parents coming back and saying you know what I'm asking her to watch YouTube and learn ABCD. I'm asking her to do. So why are we hurrying up? I'm talking about two-year-old child. I'm talking about four-year-old child. Um, um, I believe in this concept. I listen to K, all right. But when I talk to my parents who come to me, uh, you know, they're all competitive in nature. I mean, they want a five-year-old to already compete. And even before the teacher finishes the question in the online session, they want them to tell the answer. And they're preparing for a competition-driven session. And had this happened within the four walls of your school, sir, or my school, no parent is involved there. You know, the child naturally grows. Sir, can you please throw some light on how the parents need to be more responsible in online sessions, sir? Thank you. My one minute is over. Thank you. I think, sir, we will just leave it to you. We will wind up the session. So many questions need one or two hours uh, you know, deliberations. So it is up to you, sir, to wind up the session. Yours will be the last word. Mr. Murli, it's a very good session. Yeah. I, very nice session. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to answer all the questions that have been raised. Maybe <laughs> some future meeting, uh, future session. Each of these is, um, is like a whole ocean in itself, this whole question of relationship with parents and the fear fears which children carry, which are now mounting actually. These are all very major issues. Why don't we just read something together and then close and close it in quietness? Shall we do that? Uh, yeah, Sh Shailesh, I would just yeah. like to say one sentence that um, will you see this gives us an opportunity to invite you again for our sessions of the study center. And everybody just loved the session and it was very brilliant. Maybe thank, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's, I'll just share this. It's a very beautiful piece, I think. So I'll just, let's just read it together. What is the significance of history in the education of the young? If one has read history, it is fairly clear that man has struggled against nature, conquered it, destroyed and polluted it. Man has struggled against man. There have always been wars. Man struggles to be free, and yet he becomes a slave to institutions and organizations, from which in turn, he tries to break away, only to form another series of institutions and organizations. There is an everlasting struggle to be free. The history of mankind is the history of tribal wars, feudal and colonial wars, the wars of the kings and nations. And it is all still going on. The tribal mind has become national and sophisticated, but it is still the tribal mind. The history of man includes its culture. It's the story of the human being who has gone through all kinds of suffering, through various diseases, through wars, through religious beliefs and dogmas, persecution, inquisition, torture in the name of God, in the name of peace, in the name of ideals. And how is all that to be taught to the young? If it is a story of mankind, the story of human beings, then both the educator and the young are the human beings. It is their story, not merely the story of kings and wars. It is a story of themselves. How can the educator help the student to understand the story of himself 
which is the story of the past, of which he is the result. That is the problem. If you are the educator and I am the young student, how would you help me to understand the whole nature and structure of myself? Myself being the whole of humanity, my brain the result of many million years. It is all in me, the violence, the competition, the aggressiveness, the brutality, the cruelty, the fear, the pleasure, the occasional joy and that slight perfume of love. How will you help me to understand all this? It means that the educator must also understand himself and so, so help me, the student, to understand myself. So it is a communication between the teacher and myself. And in that process of communication, he is understanding himself and helping me to understand myself. It is not that the teacher or the educator must first understand himself and then teach, that would take the rest of his life perhaps, but that in the relationship between the educator and the person to be educated, there is a relationship of mutual investigation. Can this be done with the young child or with the young student? In what manner would you set about it? That is the question. How would you as a parent go into this? How would you help your child to understand the whole nature and structure of his mind, of his desires, of his fears, the whole momentum of life? It is a great problem. Are we prepared as parents and teachers to bring about a new generation of people? For that is what is implied, a totally different generation of people with totally different minds and hearts. Are we prepared for that? If you are a parent, would you give up for the sake of your child, drink, cigarettes, pot, you know, the whole drug culture, and see that both you and the child are good human beings? The word good means well-fitting, psychologically, without any friction, like a good door, you understand, like a good motor. Also, good means whole, not broken up, not fragmented. So are we prepared to bring about through education a good human being, a human being who is not afraid, afraid of his neighbor, afraid of the future, afraid of so many things, disease and poverty. Also, are we prepared to help the child and ourselves to have integrity? The word integrity also means to be whole and to say what you mean and not say one thing and do something else. Integrity implies honesty. Can we be honest if we have illusions and romantic and speculative ideals and strong beliefs? We may be honest to a belief, but that does not imply integrity. As it is, we bring children into the world, spoil them till they are two or three, and then prepare them for war. History has not taught human beings how many mothers must have cried, their sons having been killed in wars. Yet we are incapable of stopping this monstrous killing of each other. If we are to teach the young, we must have in ourselves a, a sense of the demand for the good. Good is not an ideal. It is to be whole, to have integrity, to have no fear, not to be confused. These are not ideals, they are acts. Can we be factual and so bring about a good human being through education? Do we really want a different culture, a different human being with a mind that is not confused, that has no fear, that has this quality of integrity? So maybe we can stop there, Murli. Yes, sir. I think there can, is a demand. Can, we can this we want shared? to have you again. <laughs> well, we'll meet again, I'm sure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you,